previously on the psychology of entrepreneurship. I would have preferred not to have this challenge if you had the choice, but the challenge is here and uh, we just got to accept that it is a challenge, it's going to be a major thing. When you've been married 40 years, it, it's really important you get on well together, which might be really obvious. If there's one thing in, in an organisation that's really important, it's that. It's not just about numbers. It's not just about making money. It's nefarious, man. Like, the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, human bodies on Earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. And you are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi, it's Ronsley. If this is your first volume, welcome. This is a weekly series where I go inside the mind of an entrepreneur, artist, athlete, academic to decipher what is the psychology of our decisions. I'm Australian and I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and community. I pay my respects to them and their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging of the land I am standing on today. I extend my respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who listen to this podcast. Let's start with this. One of the most common questions I get asked when I'm interviewed on other podcasts is, Ronsley, what is your favorite quote and who said it? And for the last six years, I've been quoting my next guest. And the other day, I got a chance to sit with him uh, virtually, albeit because he's in Singapore. And well, he is, um, I'll let him tell you. I'm Paul Dunn. Right now I'm in Singapore. And it's, uh, what is it? Three days after my birthday. There you go. It's the 2nd of December. The quote, if you're wondering, is, Ronsley, the failure or success of achieving a goal isn't as important as the person you become in attempting that goal. This is what he told me after I said to him that I was really nervous and I was having panic attacks about putting on the first podcasting conference in the Southern Hemisphere back in 2015 called We Are Podcast. Anyway, besides the point, uh, the reason I was talking with him even back then is that I've been a fan and a huge supporter of his co-founded company called B1G1, which stands for buy one, give one. So that you understand the concept of B1G1, this is Masami Sato, the founder and now CEO of B1G1. I'm Masami Sato, founder of the Global Giving Initiative B1J1. I think every business starts with a sense of aspiration, but often many business owners feel that they are not ready to do great things yet. One day, a simple idea came to me. What if every business could make a difference in their own way just by doing what they normally do? That's how B1J1 started in 2007. And that simple idea is now a reality. Authors planting trees for every book they sell. Dentists providing access to life-saving water for every patient they help. Accountants giving children access to e-learning for every client they create. Their stories are endless, and these businesses are transforming lives every day. Paul Dunn is 77 years young and will run laps around the city of Singapore. Literally, no jokes. Paul, if you look back, what stands out for you? What stands out for me is how lucky I am and how grateful I am to, you know, to have experienced all of those sorts of things, right? But not just grateful to... Uh, have experienced them, but grateful to you, for example, to, you know, being able to have a platform where you can talk about that and, and hopefully where other people, remember we talked about leaving and living and leveraging, right? Uh, so hopefully, you know, these uh, ideas, we can learn to live in that grateful state uh, and, and just do incredibly amazing things from that state. Uh, rather than a state of, oh, you know, look at me, you know, <laughs> things aren't too good over here, right? Paul has had an incredible entrepreneurial journey and his latest one, B1G1, 
uh, asks you and I to imagine. Imagine a world where everything we do makes a difference. Imagine every time a business sells a product, it also creates life-changing impacts. Imagine every time you serve your client, something special happens somewhere in the world. Imagine a world that's full of giving. Some, some people say things like, you know, well, you give on account of how you get because you give. No, 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 no. And that's just that's pure BS, right? That is pure and utter BS. Um, you give because it's, here's the interesting thing, it's self-serving. Now, now you go, well, hang on a second. How can serving others be self-serving? Because every single one of us is at our best when we're giving. It's as simple as that. I mean, it really is simple. Um, it was called the monopoly distinction. And he said, at enlightened companies, leaders are smart enough to ask, how do we make things better for our customers? Right? Just, just pause for a minute and think about that. How do we make things better for our customers? And, the, and then they realize that this simple ratchet leads to loyalty, word of mouth, and more customers. At monopolies or companies that seek to act like them, it's a different question. The question is, how do we make things better for us? <laughs> so if you think about it, what a great question that first one is uh, on the entrepreneurial journey. You know, how do we make things better for our customers? It's, it's so, such, a, such a cool question. And to realize that as, as you do that, and this isn't the reason that you do it, but it just happens, you know, that it's like this universal law that when you're doing that, it kind of stretches you. Uh, as, a, as a result. But you don't do it because it stretches you. You just sort of do it and, and, and it happens to stretch you if that's, uh, that's, if that's the way. And so you, you don't give because then you get. You, you give because it becomes the best version of you. And guess what? The best version of you becomes much more attractive than a lesser version of you. This is Elizabeth Dunn's TED Talk titled Helping others makes us happier, but it matters how we do it. And she starts her talk by going straight to the question that's on all our minds. So I have a pretty fun job, which is to figure out what makes people happy. It's so fun, it might almost seem a little frivolous, especially at a time where we're being confronted with some pretty depressing headlines. But it turns out that studying happiness might provide a key to solving some of the toughest problems we're facing. It's taken me almost a decade to figure this out. Pretty early on in my career, I published a paper in Science with my collaborators entitled Spending Money on Others Promotes Happiness. I was very confident in this conclusion, except for one thing. It didn't seem to apply to me. I hardly ever gave money to charity, and when I did, I didn't feel that warm glow I was expecting. So I started to wonder if maybe there was something wrong with my research or something wrong with me. My own kind of uh, lackluster emotional response to giving was especially puzzling because my follow-up studies revealed that even toddlers exhibited joy from giving to others. Well, I'm not going to give the end away, but if you're interested, the link to the TED Talk will be in the show notes, just like every other link, and you can find that at psychologyofentrepreneurship.com. In a powerful quote from Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she stated that if you want to be a true professional, you will do something outside yourself, something to repair tears in your community something to make life a little better for people less fortunate than you. That's what I think a meaningful life is. Living not for oneself, but for one's community. Paul has a history in the corporate world. The, the company that I was working for back then, it was way, I mean, this is way back when, right? Um, and in order to get on, I was, I was in the research department of this particular electronics company and um, in order to get on, I noticed that you had to have the right school tie. And, and, and that didn't, 
<laughs> it didn't suit me because I didn't have the right school tie. And then one day, this Australian uh, entrepreneur walks into the research lab. His name, I remember it like yesterday, was Jem Snitch, believe it or not. That was his real name. And uh, he was running uh, the company, uh, the offshoot of the company uh, in Australia. And he stood up and he said, uh, good day. He said, my name's uh, Snitch. Most people call me Jim. And he said, uh, I'm here looking for, uh, for somebody to be the chief engineer. So if any of you, this is literally, you know, any of you want to put up your hand to be the chief engineer, you're it, right? So I looked around, no one else put up their hands, and I did. And next thing I knew, I'm on a plane uh, heading, to, <laughs> heading to Australia. You know, I saw palm trees for the first time in my life and uh, all of that and learned about footy and goodness knows what else. And... Uh, I very quickly got headhunted, uh, which sort of upset Jim a bit, but uh, by uh, Hewlett Packard. And I was one of the first 10 in Hewlett Packard in, uh, in Australia. And that was an amazing experience. And that because, and it was, it was amazing because uh, in those days, I got to meet and literally sit down over breakfast uh, frequently. Uh, with people like Bill Hewlett and people like Dave Packard. I mean, we're talking about the guys who created, you know, this entity from their garage in Silicon Valley, right? And here am I, you know, discussing all of this. And then I got to go to Palo Alto and see what that was like. And, and I mean, HP was just an amazing, amazing place to, to be. Um, and it was a very different HP than, than now. Um, in as much as we were concerned with, you know, high-level sort of instrumentation and stuff like that, and uh, which which I loved, I absolutely loved it. But then I, 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 the entrepreneurship bug got me, and I realised that, and these this was in the days when, uh, you know, anything computerised was done almost with magnetic cards, you know, and I realised there was perhaps an opportunity to do something different there. And so I, uh, I, I, I wrote some software which uh, some people kind of thought was cool and I embedded it kind of in HP because that was the only way I, I, I could think of to do it. And then, uh, and then I realized, hang on a second, there's another way of doing this and, and that is to create a company that does it. So, Paul, when did you realize you were an entrepreneur? If you look back now, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty. I think I realized that I was an entrepreneur when I was like uh, 14 years old. And I, I was, uh, I was uh, born in the United Kingdom and we I lived in this uh, little mining village and my dad was a miner and uh, wealth was not something we had. Let me put it to you that way. <laughs> and so I, uh, I had to find, I had to find ways of generating pocket money. Uh, so I had uh, two jobs, one, two quote unquote jobs, one of which was entrepreneurial, one of which was not. So the entre- the non-entrepreneurial one was working for the local milkman. Now what that meant was I had to get up at four thirty in the morning and and del- del- deliver milk. And I used to, uh, when I knocked on people's doors, I would have to develop this particular sound, which was me. I, I can remember that like it was yesterday. Uh, and I figured that wasn't going to go anywhere, you know, in, 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 but at least it was you know, generating some stuff. So then uh, I had always fancied myself as, uh, when I was 14, I, I bought myself a, uh, well, I, I bought myself a drum kit. I didn't. I, I bought myself uh, some drum sticks and I used to use the furniture as drums, right? So, but some of my parents didn't like that too much. Uh, but um, that got me into music, and it got me singing a bit. And then, together with a, a friend of mine, uh, I uh, I thought, oh, why don't we start a little band? So we started a little band, um, and that was my first uh, entrepreneurial thing, I suspect. But in 2007, he had a moment of realization. And that moment of realization included a stat that you would want to hear straight from Paul's mouth. And 
And it was at that moment that I realized, whoa, hang on a second, <laughs> there's, there's something else here. There's, there's something else that we as entrepreneurs can impact. And, and that is the, the, the people who didn't win the birth lottery. I mean, there's, you know, uh, my friend Paul Pullman uh, talks about, uh, and it's an amazing stat, you know, he, he talks about uh, there are only 2% of people in the world who, who won the birth lottery. What's the birth lottery? You were born in a hospital, you got food, you got water, you got medical attention. Only 2% right, of us, which means there's 98% who didn't. And that, that's just a lottery, right? So, so uh, once you get this, the, 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 there's that almost responsibility to do that, right? Then it changes everything. And it changes everything in a really interesting way. And that is that it doesn't become, you know, often obligations are things that you, oh God, you know, I've got to do that, right? That's, that's the problem with saying obligations. Um, but how it changes you is once you, once you see that, you, you get to live out a different, a different journey. When we come back, the simple act of giving and the business of buy one, give one. Our aim with this audio documentary has always been to build a strong community of entrepreneurs and creatives to provide a space where they can use their voice to share their authenticity with the world. As a valued listener, your voice matters too. We love to hear your feedback and ideas, so don't be shy to let us know how we're doing in the ratings and comments. If you have a message for our production team or know someone who would be a perfect fit as a guest, you can find out more information on how to share your input at psychologyofentrepreneurship.com. So, Paul, how would you explain buy one, give one? What does B1, G1 do? It is this historically important idea which says this imagine a world where every time business is done in whatever shape that takes every time business is done something great happens in our world just imagine that world it, 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 imagine if every time someone sends an email and excuse my swallow there because you know i mean i know what's coming right <laughs> and it's it it is profound it, it's so simple to say but really seriously shatteringly important so imagine if we were in a world where every time an email was sent a kid got access to water bearing in mind that there are 700 million of those kids that don't have access and then you think well that's pretty interesting but it gets really interesting when you consider and i, I as it turned out i looked this up yesterday right you can go on a, on a website called internetlivestats.com and you can find out how many emails are sent per second let me give you the answer 2.9 million as of yesterday per second Right? So just imagine, you know, we could do that. Or just imagine, you know, I, I, I once wrote to the late Steve Jobs and uh, I, I said, you know, how Steve used to get on and Steve would say, uh, you know, there are three things I want to talk about today, right? Three things. And then he would do the three things because you, know, you and I know as entrepreneurs, you know, three is an interesting, interesting number, right? So, so he would say three things and then he would finish the three things and, and everyone's going, oh, that was great. And then he'd go, ah! Just one more thing, just one more thing. Remember all of that? And I once wrote to him and I said, I would love you to be able to say just one more thing. Every time someone downloads an app, something great happens beyond the app, right? And I just, I, you should just get hold of that. 
and and you and I can make that happen, particularly when we we understand that in order to do that in the B1 G1 universe, it's like one cent to make that happen. And and so you also see something else, you know, in the in the you were talking about how things have changed, right? So in the quote unquote old days, by the way, the old days are like yesterday, right? It's so it's moving so fast. But anyway, but in the in the really old days, right? You, if you know, entrepreneurs would this, this is the way it worked, right? Entrepreneurs would go, Oh, okay, I'm, I'm aiming to be successful, I'm really aiming to be successful, pushing out. And then, you know, you'd say, Well, what about what, what, you know, you've thought about giving, you know, that sort of would seem to be, oh, yeah, when I'm successful, yeah, it was always like, you know, it's like it's up here, right? What is it that you don't understand about the journey? Right, and when that's embedded in the journey from day one, guess what? You accelerate your, for all the reasons that we talked about before. Right, you accelerate your uh, your success there. So, um, so yeah, that's uh, that's the first thing about what is B one G one. So, for you that wonders about B one G one, it is like a dual marketplace, like Uber or Airbnb. In Uber's case, the two marketplaces are the drivers and the people wanting drives. In Airbnb's case, it is the empty houses and the people wanting unique holidaying options. In B1G1's case, the two marketplaces are quite beautiful. The first marketplace are a bunch of projects all across the world that need help. And the second part of that marketplace are thousands of businesses that want to make an impact in their little way to those projects. So, for example, an accountant could say, every time we save our clients a dollar in tax, we keep a girl in school who has been saved from sex trafficking. You can do that. The projects are vetted and vetted quite rigorously. Paul has an example of a type of project I'm talking about. We have the, what we call B1G1 study tours, right? So, uh, well, when pandemics aren't around, and uh, so you know, a group of group of uh, B1G1 members get together, and we go to various places. Now, you notice what I called them? I called them a study tour, B1G1 study tour, and we go there to learn. And uh, in other words. What we don't want to do, you know, frequently you go on these, these, or you see these tours advertised where you've got to, you know, you've got to get out and you've got to raise so much money because when you go, that's going to go to the project. And so you, you may, I mean, you turn up, you know, you're the rich white guy who's got the money and you've got the, you know, you've got the service. We, we don't want that. We want to go there to learn. And boy, oh boy, do we learn. Like, for example, maybe there are some people in Queensland who are listening to us right now, right? And maybe if you're in the north of Queensland, you look outside and you'll see a mango tree, right? There's mango trees, right? And and uh, and, and so here we are in, in, in Kenya and we're at, a, we're at a project called the mango tree, which is kind of interesting, right? Now, what have they done? Have a listen to what they did. The, the lady, her name is Consolata, and she gets a phone call one day to say, you have inherited 9,000 orphans. Now, just imagine that phone call. Uh, you are going to be responsible for 9,000 orphans, right? Now, when I say inherited, it doesn't mean all of her relatives died or something like that. She, she was just in a circumstance, right? So, so what would you do? Well, you would look at orphanages and you would say, that's probably not a good look. That's probably not a good look. So what can we do? Well, what if we put them with their extended families. Oh, that might be a good look. But then the problem is when we put them with their extended families, their extended families might see them as a liability rather than an asset. So how can we change that? Mango tree was the answer. So here's what they did. They got these mango trees, seriously, and they crossed the mango tree with a fast-growing Kenyan thing, right, plant, right? And the result of this was amazing. A typical mango tree takes eight years to grow. Once they crossed it with this this fast-growing Kenyan thing, the mango tree takes two years to grow. Second thing, it produces more fruit than the eight-year fruit. The third thing is a mango tree, you've got to be fairly tall to pick the mangoes, or you've got to have a ladder, right, to pick to pick it, right? This mango tree grows like to about this height, and the height I'm indicating in Wonsi right now is like about two foot, 
right? Two to three foot, which means a kid can get underneath it and pick the mango, right? So the kids are pretty cool. Now, what's the real key to all of this? The key to all of that is that what they want to do is they want to take these, these family members, right? And they want to get them to invest a dollar fifty. In fact, they want them to get, invest ten dollars, right? Or eleven dollars, whatever it is, to buy ten mango trees. Now, why do they want them to do that? Because in and they want them to have to have money in it. They don't want you know it's not going to be a gift, right? So it's money in it. And in two years, this 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 mango tree, each mango tree will produce eight hundred beautiful wonderfully beautiful mangoes. Now, if you've got 10 of them, that's 8,000. Now, what you can do with that 8,000, you can take them down the market and you can sell them and all that sort of stuff. You can also eat some of them, but when you take a proportion of that down the market and sell it, guess what you end up doing? You end up providing enough funds to put two kids, two kids through school every year. So the, 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 the mango tree isn't just about producing the mangoes. It's, it's about the outcome. Remember we talked about outcomes before? It's about the outcome of that. Each project listed on B1G1 contributes to one or more of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. These goals were adopted in 2015 by world leaders to get us to the next step in ending poverty, fighting inequality and injustice, and tackling climate change globally for the next 15 years. You know, I hate, yes, hate, when I'm walking down the street or in a mall and someone interrupts my day to guilt me into regularly giving to a charity that I don't believe in or a cause that they just think that everyone should care about. You know what I'm talking about. Because frequently when we, when we think about giving, we, we think about people who are in, you know, uh, less uh, good circumstances than us. And, and we sometimes feel guilty. Uh, about that, and 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 sadly, 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 you know, this is about the psychology of, of this, you know, and, and everything. So, sadly, what happens is people know that, right? So they they show you know pictures of uh, emancipated children and all of those sorts of things, so that we feel ostensibly we feel guilty, and we go, oh, we can do that, right? But guess what? Guess what? It, it shouldn't take us too long to figure out that guilt is not something that we want to feel every day. We don't. <laughs> we just don't. It's not a good look, right? But what we do want to feel every day is joy. That's what we want to feel, right? And so once we understand this whole thing around who the real beneficiary is, right? the real beneficiary is you. That's, that's the message, right? So that has just got to be a very joyful uh, experience for, for for you. You know, someone, someone yesterday wrote in and said um, it's December the first, uh, and 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 I uh, I made a commitment to you know to be in B one G one by December the first, and I'm in B one G one by December the first, and I made a commitment to do my first giving. And she said, I just pushed the button. This is what her LinkedIn post said, right? I just pushed the button, and he said, Oh, that felt so good. Right? So it's that kind of experience that. You know, B1G1 allows you to create day in, day out. Or as, as we say it, you know, every second, every day and in every way. Paul now is the chairman and cheerleader for B1G1, a company he co-founded with Masami Sato, who you heard from at the top of the program. And Paul and I were talking about this idea of mothers being the original entrepreneurs, especially founder entrepreneurs that kind of birth a new thing. We nurturing this idea and then, you know, we, we give, uh, we give birth to it. Then we, uh, and what's also interesting, of course, is we also have to go through this as entrepreneurs. This is a really tough one, actually, where we have to go through this, um, this kind of letting go process, right? You know, as as whatever it is starts to grow, you you it's like a teenager, right? And and and, and you're not, you know, <laughs> your teenager is wishing like, oh, you got out the way of, of them, and I think your entity is wishing like, hell oh, that you know you would get out of the way of it because you might have been great at starting this thing, but that doesn't necessarily mean 
uh, that you're the human being who should be growing it. And frequently uh, we see, don't we, that um, entrepreneurs are good at, you know, good at creating great things, but not necessarily are the, the right people to go and, and lead it uh, as it grows. And by the way, I, I go through that. Uh, and uh, it's a re- once you go through it, by the way, it's really interesting. Because, no, it really is. Uh, because to some extent, there's this, the, uh, and you know, people like Dan Priestley talk about it and so on and so forth. There's this kind of desert that you go through uh, as, as you scale things. And it's it's that's when the the stress really really sort of hits it right, and so it's kind of interesting to think oh well that's just a teenager and all I got to do is get out the way and they'll get across that desert quicker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Coming up on the psychology of entrepreneurship. No, but because my name, I'm multi-skilled, I guess. Psychology of entrepreneurship. When I was five or six, I dreamed of having my own radio show. Uh, at the age of ten, I was selling milk to the school teachers. Uh, I would sell pork. At sixteen, I had my own honey brand. Well, I'm a positive person, I think, uh, and I've also learned that something that you wanted that didn't happen, the fact that it didn't happen was one of the best things ever because it's the universe taking you somewhere else. Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I interviewed Paul Dunn because he is the chairman of B1G1, buy one, give one. B1G1 or Business for Good has been featured in leading edge publications such as Forbes, Fast Company, Springwise, Mashable, as well as Voice of America. Already, B1G1 has created over 150 million giving impacts all across the world. Paul is a four time TEDx speaker and winner of the Global Lifetime Achievement Award for Service to accounting profession. He is also the first recipient of the Outstanding Contribution to the Profession Award. Psychology of Entrepreneurship. This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Editing, voiceovers, and sound design by Kelly Bunnyman and Tiago Vega. Guest research and content by Claire Gould and Corinne Castles. Project managed by Kelly Bonnyman. Produced and hosted by me, Ron Slivas. For more episodes and where to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Love the polished audio docu-series style of this podcast, The Psychology of Entrepreneurship? At We Are Podcast, you can learn how to create a similar style for your own show. This revolutionary virtual event assembles podcasters, entrepreneurs, and marketers in one spot, so you're able to learn from the masters. Head straight to wearepodcast.com to reserve your spot at our next event. Are you still listening? Here's a little gift to you for sticking around. If you really enjoyed, if you really enjoyed, if you've got like one idea from this particular podcast, whether it's a business idea, whether it's a productivity idea, whether it's a life idea, whether it's how to take care of your kids better and and work from home, it doesn't matter what it is. If you've got one idea, then all you can do is you remember we said, you know, we're doing the whole thing for sex trafficking and stuff like that. Remember that? Well, you can actually go to our website right now and you will see that there on our website. You just click the button and and you can add to that. If you would like to add to that, we'd love you to do that, right? So, you know, things like that are are, uh, eminently uh, eminently possible uh, through, uh, through B1G1.